So in part one, we talked about how Sir Raymond Derry brought a bunch of lying peasants in front of Eddard and started a war between the Starks and the Lannisters. Lord Beric's Justice League was largely slaughtered, and its survivors were transformed into the Brotherhood Without Banners. So who exactly are these brothers? Well, let's first look at how the Brotherhood describes themselves. Beric says they are 40 survivors from House Stark, Derry, Dundarian, Mallory, and Wild. Harwin claims that hundreds, perhaps thousands of others have joined them. The mission is to protect the small folk, and Thoros says there is a spiritual, supernatural element to their brotherhood, with Beric returning from the dead. However, the Hound just calls them a bunch of sorry outlaws and broken men. So the Brotherhood Without Banners seems to have a small folk element, a spiritual, supernatural element, and a broken man outlaw element. Next, let's talk about the three horses at the Inn of the Kneeling Man. When Jamie and Brienne first come across the network of the Brotherhood Without Banners, it's at the Inn of the Kneeling Man. They find three horses in the stables. The first is a brown plow horse. Now this is very close to the sigil of House Derry, which is the brown plowman. The second is an ancient white gelding with one eye. Of course, this is very similar to Blood Raven. And the third horse is a lost knight's palfrey with a pink and black saddlecloth. Now this one is harder to place, but Arya, as Nymeria, does note that Thoros's cloak is pink and Beric's cloak is black. So if I were to guess, I would say the first horse represents the Brotherhood's small folk element, the second its spirituality, and the third its broken men element. And finally, let's talk about the Kingswood Brotherhood, which is the inspiration for the Brotherhood Without Banners, according to the songs of Tom of Seven Streams. The Kingswood Brotherhood was led by Simon Toyne, a man from a house of a disgraced Kingsguard. Toyne's band of outlaws was largely successful because he had the support of the small folk. Eventually, Arthur Dane of the Kingsguard realized he needed to win the small folk back if he hoped to defeat the Kingswood Brotherhood. The Kingswood Brotherhood had a number of crazy characters, but most notably, they had a character who seemed to also come back from the dead. So again, we have our three elements, and in many ways, Simon Toyne is very similar to Sir Raymond Derry. They both come from houses with heavy connections to the Kingsguard, but their houses have fallen from their prominence. Now, the Brotherhood Without Banners network of friends is extensive. What do I mean? Well, let's follow Arya's journey and see which houses support the Brotherhood Without Banners. After the Inn of the Kneeling Man, she meets old and crazy Lyman Leicester. After that, they visit the Lady of the Leaves, and Jack B. Lucky reveals that he's from Piperland. After that, they head to Acorn Hall, and they meet with Lady Smallwood. They visit prostitutes at Stony Sept and catch the Hound. He goes on trial at Barrack's hideout. They accuse the Hound of having a hand in the deaths of a squire from House Root, a knight from House Charlton, and the Bastard of Bracken. They make it back to where Notch is from in the lands of Goodbrook, and Barrack reveals that he's been working with the Maester from House Vance. So based on Arya's journey, these houses seem to be supporting the Brotherhood, or at least have small folk that support the Brotherhood. And on top of these houses, the Brotherhood also has hookers. Now let's fast forward to a Feast of Crows when Jamie is at the Siege of River Run. He notes Leicesters, Vances, Roots, Goodbrooks, Smallwoods, Pipers, and he notes that the Brackens would be there, but they're fighting the Blackwoods. It's the same houses, with the exception of House Charlton, which actually is there as well. House Charlton is sworn to House Frey and is over in the Frey camps. The Riverland houses that aren't there, such as Malister, Ryger, and Page, give Jamie some pause but he fails to put much thought into the many prostitutes that have infiltrated the Lannister camps or the presence of Tom of Seven Streams. So despite claiming to be politically neutral, the Brotherhood Without Banners is clearly up to something. But what? In support of a northern king? Doubtful. Most of our Brotherhood collaborators have a very poor opinion of northerners. The husband at the end of the Kneeling Man doesn't think there's any difference between northerners and Lannisters. Tom of Seven Streams seems to have the same animosity for Northmen as does Lem Lemoncloak, as does the Lady of the Leaves, as do the Septons of Sally Dance, as does Lady Smallwood, and as do the people of Stony Sept. Maybe they simply support the Tullys? Well, that's more likely, but still houses like Goodbrook hate the Tullys, and Tom of Seven Streams doesn't seem to be a fan. And I would have to ask why foreigners like Thoros and Greenbeard would even care. After all, if the Brotherhood is truly a humanitarian organization concerned with small folk, who cares who rules in King's Landing or River Run? So we're going to put the question of why the Brotherhood showed up to River Run on hold for the moment, but it's important. Now I'd like to talk about Greenbeard for a second. Now according to Beric, there are two types of people in the Brotherhood. There is the original detachment who left King's Landing, like 
Beric and Harwin and Angai. And then there are people who have joined up who are probably from the Riverlands, like the Mad Huntsman, or Tom of Sevens, or Notch. So why are there foreigners in the company, like Greenbeard and that Bravosi sellsword? Well, my only explanation on who they could be are Lannister defectors. In a Game of Thrones, when Lannister forces are besieging River Run, Stark forces attack their forces on the northern bank. Lannister forces on the southern bank start an orderly retreat, but weirdly, a sellsword company, led by a Tyrashi, decide to abandon the Lannisters. Now the Lannisters think that in pursuit of money, the Tyrashi has gone over to rob Stark. But at no point do we ever hear about a sellsword company joining the northern forces. I mean, yes, there's the brave companions at Harrenhal, but that's a completely different story. The point being, at a not-so-intense time of battle, a sellsword company decided to defect to... no one. Kevin Lannister criticizes them for only caring about money, but they didn't do anything for money. And since we have a Tyrashi who disappears into the Riverlands, and another one that appears from the Riverlands out of nowhere, I'm guessing that Greenbeard was this Tyrashi. And yes, the Brotherhood Without Banners is a refuge for broken men, but how is an orderly retreat something that would give soldiers PTSD? And so Greenbeard is a bit of an enigma. He's not one of Beric's men of justice, he's not a Riverlander, he's not a broken man, and if he's a sellsword, he's a pretty bad one because he doesn't seem to be seeking money. But the weirdest thing about him is that he's high ranking. When Arya runs into Lem Lemoncloak, Tom of Sevens, Angai, Harwin, and Jack B. Lucky, it's Greenbeard who is their leader. That means only Beric and Thoros are higher ranking. That's a bit weird for a Tyrashi sellsword who should have no connections to the Riverlands. So despite being a homegrown organization, the Brotherhood Without Banners is led by two foreigners and a zombie. And despite claiming to be for justice and the small folk, the Brotherhood has an ambitious political agenda, although we're not sure what it is. And speaking of agenda, I'd like to talk about Tom of Sevens and the Brotherhood's death list. In A Storm of Swords, the Hound is put on trial for murder. Now it's important to note that the Brotherhood believes in collective blame and collective punishment. The Brotherhood starts listing the murders of the Mountain and expects the Hound to pay for them. Now Harwin begins with Lord Lothar Mallory and Sir Gladden Wilde. These were men the Mountain killed at the Mummer's Ford. Now it's a bit peculiar that he's excluding Sir Raymond Derry. When Harwin told the story before to Arya, he mentioned Sir Raymond Derry first and described a very gruesome death. The Mountain chopped off Derry's arm before moving on to Wilde and Mallory. So it's a bit weird to exclude the first and most gruesome of the trio. What's also odd is that Harwin describes Derry dying first, by sword, before Beric Dondarrion. And yet we know from Edric Dane that Beric Dondarrion dies via lance. How and why would anyone switch from a sword to a lance in the middle of battle? I suppose it's like father like son with suspicious deaths by the mountain. Anyway, moving on. Jack B. Lucky is next to speak and lists his brothers Lister and Lennox. Now in A Game of Thrones, the mountain is specifically said to burn out Piperland and Brackenland. Since Jack B. Lucky is from Piperland, this story makes sense. Next we get some Robin Hood jokes with Mudge the Miller's son and Merriman's widow, and we hear about a bunch of people we don't know anything about. Tom of Sevens picks up the count and names Alan of Winterfell and a bunch of other people that also sound like fallen brothers. He names some people from Brackenland and some others that sound like innkeeps or prostitutes. And this is where it gets weird. Tom of Sevens lists a whole bunch of dead pates. Pate of Mori, Pate of Lancewood, Old Pate, Pate of Shermer's Grove. But he's missing a pate. He's missing Pate of the Blue Fork, his cousin. Why on earth would Tom leave out his own cousin on his death list? We're not exactly sure how Pate of the Blue Fork dies, but we know he's killed by the mountain. Tom then lists Sir Raymond Derry, Lord Derry, and young Lord Derry. Wait a minute, isn't Sir Raymond Derry already Lord Derry? Who the hell is this second Lord Derry? He's not referring to Sir Raymond Derry, because then he would say Lord of Derry. So let's take a look at the Derry family tree. Raymond Derry and Lyman Derry are supposedly dead, and Lyman was the last male of the House of Derry. This means Derry should fall to Raymond's cousin Maria Derry, who is married to Merritt Frey. That's right, the extinguishing of House Derry leads to House Frey taking over the lands. Now the Lannisters decide to take Derry land for themselves, so they marry Lancel to Gatehouse Amy. Now weirdly, Amy used to be married to Pate, and also weirdly, the Brotherhood kills Merritt Frey, and Lancel, who marries Amy, ends up giving up the lands, probably after talking to the elder brother. The point of all of this is that the Brotherhood is weirdly connected to the lands of Derry, and then there's that suspicious Derry-Frey rivalry. We'll talk about that, and hopefully talk about what the Brotherhood is up to, all in part three.